it's clear that many of us in Britain are in love with the past. Whether it's swordcraft or spitfires, mead or musketry, we relish harking back. But it's not so much history we're in love with as something rather less true, but just as powerful, the olden days. Mention the olden days to any child and they'll know exactly what you mean. It's a precise historical period, dating back from when their parents were children to about 10,000 years BC. It's the vast realm of everything that's supposedly gone before. Some of it is in black and white, some of it's in glorious technicolour, and a lot of it is slightly out of focus. But even when we grow up as adults in this country, many of us retain that deep fascination for a heightened, idealised, imagined past, including me. In this series, I'll be enjoying the very best of the olden days. As seen in our art, our literature and our occasionally delusional collective consciousness. I'll be looking at two of our oldest, greatest heroes. Our need for colourful, time-honoured tradition. And our deep love for the countryside of yesterday. But I do have a warning for you. The olden days has the best characters and the best stories, though not necessarily the best facts. It's the place for myths and legends, for that grey area between truth and fiction. It's often what we want to believe happened rather than what really happened, and it's quite often what the person writing the history is very keen for us to believe. But the extraordinary thing about the olden days is that they've always been alive and active, creative and influential, and very much in the here and now. It's odd but true that we're pretty familiar with our deepest past. And though they're known as the Dark Ages, it's amazing how vividly we still connect to the stories of Celts, Anglo-Saxons and Vikings, to that vast and vague epoch between the Romans leaving in 410 AD and the Normans arriving in 1066. The thing about going back to the mists of time is that they're pretty misty. Information about the Dark Ages is in short supply, so we can fill in the gaps with our imagination, furnishing these very olden days with a cast of wizards, dragons and charismatic warrior kings. It's to two characters in particular that we have returned again and again. The first, King Arthur, probably never existed. The second, Alfred the Great, was certainly real, but was reinvented to suit the needs of every age. These two very different Dark Age kings are pillars of our national story, our foundation myth. Out of their heroic deeds and the round tables and the burnt cakes emerges the idea of Britain itself. Everyone knows Arthur, or so they think. His story has swirled around for at least a thousand years. But where did the tales of Arthur actually start? The very earliest references are a few obscure fragments 
depicting him as a wild Celtic warlord from Wales in perhaps the early 6th century. But the figure we know, a king conceived here in Tintagel in Cornwall, a king with a band of brave knights and a magical ally called Merlin was created in the traumatic aftermath of the Norman conquest. And that's because it's when things change the most that the past becomes most inspiring. Arthur put on a leather jerkin worthy of so great a king. On his head, he placed a golden crest carved in the shape of a dragon. He girded on his peerless sword called Caliburn, which was forged in the Isle of Avalon. A spear called Ron graced his right hand, long, broad and thirsty for slaughter. The man who penned Arthur's story was a monk, Geoffrey of Monmouth, in the year 1136. His book was called History of the Kings of Britain. Yet, Geoffrey didn't claim to have written it. Cleverly, he claimed to have translated it from a very old book in the British tongue, which he'd been given. No one has ever found this very old book, probably because it doesn't exist. But Geoffrey was very keen to claim it as a source, to make his history seem more ancient, more venerable, more true. He wanted to create the authentic account of a glorious but vanished age. Geoffrey recounted that it was Brutus of Troy, no less, who'd first led the perilous voyage to distant Albion to defeat its giants and rename it Britain after himself. You'll find Julius Caesar in Geoffrey's history, not to mention King Lear and even old King Cole. But the character that really grabbed the hearts and minds of the newly arrived Normans was Celtic King Arthur. The Normans wanted to feel that they belonged in Britain, that they were part of the story. So they weren't interested in Anglo-Saxon heroes. These were the people they just conquered, the people who they could see digging ditches and feeding swine outside their castle walls. But when Geoffrey of Monmouth came up with an obscure Celtic hero from hundreds of years before, who'd actually taken on the Saxon invaders at the time, then this was ideal for the new rulers. And it proved surprisingly popular amongst their Anglo-Saxon subjects, because for them, the story was all about a local hero resisting cruel, tyrannous foreign invaders. So Arthur became a shared British hero from a safely distanced but romanticised past, the mystical, magical olden days. Even at the time, this was all too much for rival historians. William of Newburgh's History of English Affairs was far more factual, but far less popular. He said of Geoffrey, It's quite clear that everything this man wrote was made up. Only a person ignorant of ancient history would have any doubt about how shamelessly and impudently he lies in almost everything. It's the historian's classic complaint. You may have the truth on your side, but if your story's dull, no one will want to read it. Thanks to Geoffrey of Monmouth's lead, Arthur flourished. European poets in the 12th century turned him into the leading man of their chivalric romances. But there was an English king whose claims to hero status far outweighed Arthur's, and he was real. This was the Christian monarch who, in 878 AD, defeated the great heathen army of the Vikings, who united Anglo-Saxon kingdoms into what would become England itself. Hello, Jane. Ian, how nice to see you. Welcome nice to St Mary's. Me. Thank you. Where's the jewel? Where's Where the jewel? We put the here? jewel out for you in the Lady Chapel. In the 17th century, an artefact was found in a field here in Somerset, which shed some light on this Dark Age king. We put it out for you on the... Uh... A replica of this priceless treasure is kept at St Mary's. 
On the front, seen through rock crystal, is an enigmatic enamelled figure. It appears to be a middle-aged man with fair hair, without a beard, slightly boss-eyed, wearing green, and his image set in this fantastic, ornate, jewelled item, which is called an astel, which is a pointer. There was a stick like this here, but it's rotted away, and it's used for pointing out passages in scripture, the important bits you point like this. The clue to who made this astel comes with its inscription in filigreed gold. It says Alvred, which is Alfred, Alfred the Great, Alvred Mech Hecht Yevurchan. Alfred had me made, which he did. He had these made um, and gave them out to various churches in order to spread the gospel. The figure in the jewel might be Christ. He might be a symbol of learning or wisdom. Tantalizingly, some have suggested he might even be Alfred himself. Whoever he is, it's one of the very few objects we have that provide a direct, tangible link to Dark Age Alfred. The man who rallied the English, the man who defeated the Vikings, the man who subsequent Victorian historians would say was the most perfect character in history. The trouble is, it doesn't matter how perfect you are if everyone forgets you. He's become rather obscure as a figure, hasn't he? I mean, there was a period where everybody knew who King Alfred was. Do you think that's true anymore? No, I think you're probably right. But um, the Alfred jewel, particularly here, mm. is, is held in, in great respect. Uh, but as a figure himself, yeah, he does seem to get lost in the midst of time. I couldn't help noticing this, um, that the You've niche... You've spotted it, yes. ..where... <laughs> Alfred used to be. There's now a plaque that says Diana, Princess of Wales. Mm. And that, another, that shows how fickle piece, history another, is. Another piece of history. Yeah. So, in a sense, the public moves on, doesn't yes. it? Yes, yes. It Finds does. other heroes. This is the heart of Wessex, the kingdom that Alfred saved. In fact, you could argue he saved the whole of England. Not only did Alfred repel the Vikings, he reorganised the army, drafted a new legal code and put learning at the heart of his kingdom. Not perhaps as exciting as pulling a sword from a stone, but rather more useful. Here was a real monarch with a genuine political, legal and cultural legacy. But people preferred fairy tale Arthur to workaday Alfred. There's gratitude for you. That's the fabulous quality of the olden days. They really are a great cabinet of curiosities. Just about everything and anything can be drawn out to suit the current times. Or tucked away again. So while Anglo-Saxon Alfred was consigned to obscurity, Celtic Arthur underwent another upgrade. Already transformed from obscure Welsh warlord into Geoffrey's superhero king, and then Europe's leading man, he was about to change again, becoming not just heroic, but holy. Arthur was now on a mission from God, questing for nothing less than the Holy Grail, the very cup Jesus drank from at the Last Supper and the transformation happened at one of the most magical sites in England. Welcome to Glastonbury Abbey. My name is Leia Frick, and I am one of the abbot's tithesmen. I'd like to start off my tours by, first of all, talking about the legend saying that Joseph of Arimathea came to Glastonbury Abbey. Joseph of Arimathea is meant to have been Jesus' great uncle. Now, Joseph brought with him a very special treasure. Many people say that Joseph would have brought the Holy Grail with him and that when he gets here, he buries this cup in the ground to prevent anyone from getting their hands on it, for using it for any evil means or anything like that. Now, sceptical historians might consider it a touch implausible that Christendom's holiest relic should fetch up in Somerset particularly since no-one had ever found it again. 
and yet it was extremely well known that in the olden days, Arthur and his knights had actually felt its holy presence right here, which made Arthur the obvious saviour for the monks of Glastonbury Abbey when, in 1184, their monastery was ravaged by fire. It was a half timber, half stone building with a thatched roof, so it's meant to burn very quickly indeed, so there's not much left. And they have just built this beautiful chapel over here. So they're obviously a bit strapped for cash, and they think finding a wonderful relic is going to reinvigorate the trade. They'll get more rich benefactors, more people want to come and visit their monastery. By an extraordinary coincidence, in their hour of darkest need, one of the monks had a vision. It told him that King Arthur himself was buried nearby. They hastily began digging, sensibly enough, in the cemetery. And would you believe it, they found some bones. The bones of the great King of Camelot and his beloved wife. Gerald of Wales was a medieval chronicler who'd been rather sniffy about Arthur until he peered inside the grave with his own eyes and he was miraculously converted. This is what he wrote he saw. A coffin made from a hollowed out oak with two bodies in it, deep in the earth at Glastonbury. And on top of the grave, there was a lead cross with an inscription on it. And Gerald not only read the inscription, he felt the letters with his fingers. And this is what it said. Here lies buried the renowned King Arthur with Guinevere, his second wife, in the Isle of Avalon. Proof. Did the monks consciously think, we've got the grail, there's some stories connected with the grail with Arthur, let's find Arthur? It may have been, yes, we desperately need money, the best way to do it is to find a very famous individual. Who has everyone heard of in England at the time? Who's popular kind of in the culture at the time? Arthur. One thing's for sure, this handy discovery of a legendary hero at just the right time certainly paid dividends. The Abbey was rebuilt as cash flooded in from all the new visitors flocking to Glastonbury. And the town has been trading on its reputation as a mystic wonderland ever since. I'd like to go back now to the real olden days, way back to the late 1970s, a golden age when I was an English student. Yes, there were Arthurian romances to read, but at university I learnt that in the history of English language, Arthur plays second fiddle to Alfred. This is my sweet Anglo-Saxon reader, a selection of texts written in the original Anglo-Saxon that we had to study as part of the course at Oxford. And one of the pieces was Pope Gregory's Pastoral Care, and it was hugely influential in England largely because we think it was the first book ever translated from Latin into English. And the person who translated it was Alfred Cunninga, King Alfred. Alfred believed in education, and as so few people understood Latin, he translated the most important works into Anglo-Saxon English. He wrote, and if you'll forgive the accent, for thou may thanks better, if ye are swa thanks, that we eak summa bech, tha they need but they are foster thin ialum monum to weatoni. He says he wants translated some books that are most needful for men to know, so they can read them in their own language. And that is a pretty progressive thought from the so-called Dark Ages. So, for early scholars, Alfred was always a hero, even though the rest of the medieval world had largely forgotten him. Perhaps that's why, when a crisis hit the newly formed University College at Oxford, it wasn't the spirit of Arthur the fellow summoned, it was Alfred. 
So what exactly are we looking at? We're looking at a piece of parchment written in the 1380s, and it records a great big legal dispute involving University College. We had acquired some land in the 1360s, and the descendants of the original vendor claimed that there was an error in the small print. And this was a big error, because if we lost the land, we'd lose two-fifths of our income. With the dispute going against them, the fellows of University College had a brainwave. They wrote this craftily penned petition to the king, Richard II, asking him to intervene in the legal dispute. So, to the most excellent, redoubtable and reverend Lord our King and his most wise counsel, your pauper petitioners, the master and scholars of your college, first founded by your noble ancestor, King Alfred, what you've got to imagine is there's Richard II probably getting a whole lot of petitioners around him and some of your majesty, look, this is a place that was founded by King Alfred, your ancestor, sire. Ah. Richard, who's a teenager, at this point says, oh, this sounds fun, I would have a look. Why did using Alfred's name appeal to Richard? Well, Richard was something of a genealogy geek among English monarchs. He, I think it's part of his wanting to project himself as very monarchic, very regal, very much the monarch. And as part of that is kind of, look at all my great line of ancestors. Alfred is suitable, he's appropriate as a monarch and as a founder, but unfortunately, he didn't found the college, did he? He didn't at all. We were really founded by a guy called William of Durham, who was a theologian at Paris, a very splendid man, but he's not exactly famous, is he? So, Despite the fact that this petition is beautifully mm. presented, it's nicely written by a scribe, mm. they've just made it up, haven't they? Yes. All of it? Yes. But it worked. It worked? Yes. We keep the property and it's all sorted. So actually King Alfred was a very good chum to us. Is there no sense of irony amongst the scholars about the fact that as a centre of academic excellence, their founding myth is, is nonsense? I had this slight feeling about the people that created this. They thought, surely we must be this ancient. Surely we must be founded by King Alfred. And you get this again and again if you look at kind of the kind of bogus histories that you see for other institutions like Cambridge or indeed Parliament. It's kind of they wish it so, that they want and to go back. it is. They go back to the olden days, even older olden days, if they possibly can. And Alfred is about as olden as the university needed. He was. He, he'll do nicely, yes. And the rest, as they say, is history, even when it isn't. Alfred was co-opted as founder of the entire university. I may have mentioned at the beginning that the stories of history can prove powerful, even when they have little connection with the truth. And this turns out to be especially the case when one is dealing with Oxford-educated lawyers. So, in the later Middle Ages, Alfred continued to have fans amongst the bookish elite. But it was dashing Arthur who remained the crowd-pleaser. At the end of the 15th century, handwritten manuscripts gave way to print in an information revolution. And one of the very first bestsellers to spring from the new printing presses was a sensational new telling of the Arthur story. Thomas Mallory's Mort d'Arthur was a very different Arthur for different, darker times. The country had just emerged from bloody civil war, the War of the Roses. Mallory wrote his epic romance while in jail. No wonder his Arthur is characterised less by Christian daring do than by betrayal, sexual intrigue and death. In Mallory's version, the treacherous Sir Mordred is Arthur's own illegitimate son and he gets his revenge on his father by attempting to marry Arthur's queen, Guinevere, and stealing his kingdom from him. Everybody you love ends up dead. And Mallory himself had seen his country torn in two by the dynastic feuding between the houses of York and Lancaster. And all his anguish and all the tragedy of that time is channeled into this Le Mort d'Arthur, one of the most influential works in English literature. 
When Sir Mordred felt that he had his death wound, he smote Arthur with his sword. The sword pierced the helmet, and therewithal Sir Mordred fell stark dead, and the noble Arthur fell in a swoon to the earth. Mallory's story was to become the basis for every subsequent Arthurian tale. From childhood classics to television adaptations and big budget movies. Back in the 16th century, Arthur's popularity made him extremely useful to a new young king. In 1509, when Henry VIII came to the throne, the Welsh Tudors were seen by many as recent upstarts. So they claimed Arthurian descent to bolster their legitimacy. Some sort of relic linking Henry to King Arthur would be absolutely ideal. Unfortunately, the Grail was buried somewhere in Glastonbury. So what else might there be? Well, how about this? This extraordinary one and a quarter ton oak phenomenon had long been one of Winchester's greatest attractions. King Arthur's Round Table, where King Arthur had presided over the ideal court at Camelot, and the knights had sat there, Sir Lancelot, Sir Galahad, Sir Gawain, Sir Bors, Sir Percival, the evil Sir Mordred. In 1522, Henry threw an extravagant Arthurian-themed party, inviting the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V to this very hall. Henry VIII was determined to impress his royal friend, so he gave the table a complete makeover. He had it painted and he put his own emblem, the Tudor Rose, smack in the middle. He also included a portrait of Arthur, who looks remarkably like Henry VIII. It wasn't subtle, but Henry didn't do subtlety. His message was clear. He was the heir to Arthur. Though the Arthurian table was pure fantasy, the parallels between Henry's court and Camelot were not. Like Arthur, Henry's love life was far from simple. His divorce from Catherine of Aragon led to the break with the Roman Catholic Church which in turn led to the English Reformation, which in turn led to the re-emergence of Alfred. The 16th century was a time of national trauma. As Catholics and Protestants died and killed for their beliefs. Iconoclastic Protestants would have melted down the Holy Grail, not revered it. Arthur was out. Alfred was in. He became a figurehead for the Protestants, cunningly reinvented to legitimise their religious revolution. This would be the most audacious piece of historical manipulation yet. Protestants wanted to have a more direct line to God, to be able to read scripture in their own language. This was revolutionary stuff. And if there's one thing we British don't much like, it's revolution. An ancient king who shared their values would make England's new religious establishment seem far less radical. And Alfred, we remember from our Anglo-Saxon reader, had translated religious works into English. Alfred took what was a religion which expresses itself mostly in the Latin, and he turns it into something available in English for English priests, for English educated laity, for English courtiers. Most people would have imagined that the first English versions of anything in the Bible were much, much later. I think they would be surprised to find out that it was Alfred who did it. Yes, he respected the English language in ways that were never the case at the time in other parts of Europe with their own native tongues and definitely believe that English people deserve to have their religion brought to them in the language that 
they lived in. And that resonated very, very strongly, of course, with the Protestant mission. The man who realized Alfred might be effectively spun to give the new Protestant nation the historical pedigree it lacked was Matthew Parker, Archbishop of Canterbury under Elizabeth I. Parker dug out an ancient biography of the Anglo-Saxon monarch, which had been written by one of Alfred's own courtiers, a bishop called Asser. Asser did his royal master proud. He presents Alfred as the supremely accomplished monarch. He defeats the Vikings, he rebuilds London, he reorganises the tax system, and he still has time to learn Latin in the evenings. This is less biography than hagiography. The problem for Alfred is that he's too perfect. He's in danger of being dull. We crave a moment of fallibility, a hint of weakness, a human touch. One good story would do it. And that is where Archbishop Parker comes in again. The king was sitting by the hearth preparing his bows and arrows and other weapons of war. When the wretched woman saw the cakes burning, she ran in, abusing the unconquered king, saying, Ah, you man! When you saw the cakes burning, why were you too lazy to turn them? For you're glad enough to eat them all hot. Now that unlucky woman little thought that he was King Alfred. The burnt cake story hadn't been in Asser originally, but Parker slipped it in, having come across it in another, later, even more obscure manuscript. Alfred's culinary cock-up soon became one of the most popular stories of the age. And Alfred, one of our most popular kings. The reinvention was more successful than Parker could ever have foreseen. This new, old king, perfect for the Protestant age, would, from the 17th century on, be known by all Britons as Alfred the Great. All stories need a hero, and the national story is no exception. When I was a child, British history was a seamless narrative of British heroes in stirring tales. And I didn't bother much then about the accuracy of the sources or whether they existed at all. I just responded to the characters. And I wasn't entirely wrong, because as I've got older, I realised that the important thing about heroes is not so much who they are, but who we need them to be. We talk about looking up to heroes, but we're actually projecting onto them our current obsessions and passions. It's this malleable quality that means Alfred could serve so many different ages in so many different ways. In the 18th century, Britain was embracing enlightenment, not enchantment. Science, not superstition. Alfred, though now nearly 900 years old, was still going strong and about to be reinvented again for a whole new generation of political players. King George II loved the army. He was the last British king to lead troops into action. He wanted to see Britain on the battlefield, preferably slaughtering the French. But his son, Frederick, Prince of Wales, had other plans. He had a vision of Britain conquering the globe from the high seas. Frederick hated his father and everything he stood for. So he set up a rival court here at Clifton in Buckinghamshire with his allies, the Patriots. So to be a Patriot means that you espouse the sort of true values of Englishness, which at this time is seen as Protestantism, liberty, commercial expansion, and a sort of maritime navy. Alfred becomes the, the Patriot's idea of what a true king should be. So he's charismatic, he's dynamic, he appeals to his people, most importantly, he's visible. The young Frederick, who mm. is the young Prince of Wales, he's got new ideas, he wants a new way of looking at things. Why does he go backwards to Alfred? 
innovation and modernity is a dirty word in the 18th century because it implies uh, a sort of a, a creativity of playing fast and loose with the rules. Whereas what you need to do is you need to be able to paint innovation as restoration of a previous idea. These chaps, the Patriots, they find in Alfred an, a mirror and an image of everything that they want themselves to be. And that's his power, that's his potency, is what you see is these, um, these men looking back into the English past to find what they want the future to look like. Frederick decided to make some noise about Alfred. Music and theater were the mass media of the age, an ideal way to transmit a political message. So, in 1740, Frederick commissioned the composer Thomas Arne and the poets David Mallet and James Thompson to write Alfred, a mask. This would show his father what a true king should be. It is an eccentric piece of work. The action principally revolves around a blind bard, a couple of fairies, and some peasants spouting political slogans. It would probably have been long forgotten, were it not for one rather memorable tune. Alfred had built a few ships and fought a few sea battles against the Vikings. But once Frederick and his songwriters had finished with him, he'd become the founder of the all-conquering Royal Navy. This was the charter, the charter of the land, and guardian angels sung the strain. Britannia became Britain's unofficial national anthem, and 270 years later, there's nothing more patriotically, tub-thumpingly British than this hymn to Alfred and the sea. As the 19th century dawned, Alfred's star remained high. But in an age of romanticism, Arthur would be born again. His new birthplace, from where he would reconquer the world, was his alleged original home, Wales. The great heyday of South Wales' industrial might is itself an olden day's memory now. Its mines and factories overgrown ruins. But in the early 19th century, Wales was undergoing a staggering transformation. Many people worried that because of industrialisation, an ancient culture was going up in smoke. Some of those who were most concerned were the very people who were driving change. Lady Charlotte Guest was an Englishwoman, the wife of one of the most successful iron makers in Wales. In 1837, she began translating a series of medieval Welsh tales, the Mabinogion. Arthurian legends were at its heart. Then said Arthur, it were well for thee, Gurhir Gwalstoutlie Thoith, 
to go upon this quest, for thou knowest all languages, and art familiar with those of the birds and the beasts. And as for you, Kai and Bedwyr, I have hope of whatever adventure ye are in quest of, that ye will achieve it. What's different about this Arthur that we have in the Mabinogion compared to the Arthur that we've been presented with before? What's new is uh, the claim for Arthur and Arthurian romance as the Welsh contribution to European literature, the cradle, if you like, of um, something which did actually affect the whole of European literature. And there's presumably a, an audience that is happy to think, well, Arthur was properly Welsh, he's ours, and we started everything. I mean, this is There well... is certainly an audience that's very happy to think that, yes, indeed. Why in this period when everyone seems to be looking forward, there's a huge industrial revolution going on, um, why is there this desire to look backwards? It's such a period of rapid change. The demographics of, of this part of Wales are changing so quickly. Old community structures are being broken up. Language is shifting. When things happen too quickly around you, people reach into the past for some kind of security. The idea of things being more under control in the olden days, uh, things being simpler and, and easier. It's ironic, isn't it, that the English wife of a, an English industrialist is trying to help the Welsh rediscover their very early roots. That's it to some extent, but but it's also, they just love knights. They love dressing up. They like suits of armour. They've got suits of armour all over their houses. I mean, what can you do? Wales was having a big olden days moment. For centuries, its language and literature had been overshadowed by a dominant English tradition. But now, the Welsh were fighting back keen to prove that their culture was just as olden as anyone else's. So they revived a tradition of Eisteddfods, celebrations of music and storytelling from the time of the medieval bards. And then they looked even further back, summoning up a tradition of pre-Roman druids. This footage is from 1926, by which time these festivals had become a national institution. Here's the future George VI and the Queen Mother joining in the fun. All these would-be Druids needed were appropriately ancient sites to meet in. Guess the date of construction of this circle of standing stones. 3000 BC, 2000 BC, 1000 BC. Try 1850. It was put up by a local enthusiast for all things druidy, and he ranged his stones around a natural phenomenon, an old glacial boulder in the middle there. But the circle of stones, the design, was modelled on a genuinely old circle of stones at Avebury in Wiltshire. Once it was put up, this did indeed become a place where Eisteddfods were held, and it became a tradition that after you'd held a, a national Eidsteadfod in one place, you left behind a circle of stones, some actually made of stones, and in latter days, they were actually made of plastic. So, oddly enough, Wales does now have a genuine heritage of mystical, druidical standing stone circles that dates all the way back to the 19th century. The Celtic past was influential well beyond Wales. Artists like Gustav Doré and Aubrey Beardsley produced works inspired by Tennyson's monumental Arthurian cycle of poems, The Idylls of the King. Some of the very first photographs, produced by Julia Margaret Cameron, were portraits and entire tableau inspired by Tennyson's tales. and the pre-Raphaelite painters revelled in Arthurian scenes, with their themes of chastity and sensuality, romance, chivalry, and a sense of mission. But Arthur wasn't the 19th century's only muse. There was another story that was endlessly reproduced, Alfred's kitchen catastrophe. 
This is the classic version of the Alfred Burns the Cake scene done by David Wilkie in 1806. Painters loved doing this particular scene, and one of the reasons was it's a historical painting, but there's a chance to do some comedy. And so Alfred is depicted literally with a red face. He is embarrassed at having made a fool of himself. And the wife, who is furious and upset, upbraids a man who, though she doesn't know it, is actually the king. The man, interestingly, has a sort of half smile on his face and he's looking complicitly at Alfred. Men, we burn cakes, what do you expect? The depiction of Alfred is changing at this period. This is a more democratic age, and therefore this picture shows him going amongst his people. When he's scolded by the woman, he doesn't say, do you know who I am, I'm the king. He accepts the scolding and he learns from it. And therefore Alfred here is a king who has to acquire the common touch, a king who has to work out how to coexist even with the most humble of his subjects. With the British Empire spread across the globe, the Victorians became ever more confident about their historical self-definition and their national myth-making. For the first time, there was space for Arthur and Alfred to share the limelight. With his retinue of knights and bevy of damsels, Arthur captured sentimental Victorian hearts. Alfred, on the other hand, appealed to something more muscular. The Victorians were happy to believe Alfred had founded most of the institutions they held dear. Public schools, universities, parliament, the law, the military. Alfred was the founding father, the embodiment of everything that was great about Great Britain. And so the 1,000th anniversary of Alfred's death was a perfect moment for the good people of Winchester, ancient capital of Wessex, to honour him properly. This was the 1901 millenary. Actually, the anniversary was two years earlier, in 1899, and they'd got the date wrong. But no matter. It was one of those slightly bonkers occasions at which we British excel. It's obviously a, a genuinely popular event. I mean, there are people hanging out the windows, lining up on the roofs. Everybody in Winchester had a day off. There were special trains bringing people down from London. It is meant to be a, a sort of hugely popular event to make everybody feel part of the British Empire. So that's a, a Highland regiment, I would think, there? Yes, yes, that's right. There are a lot of um, different units, for, both from the army and the, the navy, taking part. And some of them have been released from service in the Boer War because it was just felt so important. What, to be here? To be here. <laughs> rather than and, on the battlefront. Uh, rather than on the back, yeah, yeah. Oh, now, yes, there's I love the this statue. one. Yeah, yeah, this is one of my favourite ones because you've got the uh, sculptor Hamo Thornycroft on the left, and you can see just how big the statue is. Mm. And he got damaged? Yes, he did. Slipped at one point and his nose got damaged and they... This isn't what you'd expect from Victorian engineering. <laughs> no, no, well, you can see it does look a bit ramshackle, <laughs> but they, uh, they, they, they know what they're doing. You can see he's holding up his sword in a way that would really be rather dangerous. Um, <laughs> he's making a cross with the hilt. Yes, he, a, the he, sword turned into a, a yeah, crucifix. He is fighting on behalf of Christianity, so he's a sort of Christian military hero. So he ticks all the boxes. Unveiling the statue, the former Prime Minister, Lord Rosebery, did, however, concede that the Alfred we reverence may well be an idealised figure, an effigy of the imagination. He'd hit the nail on the head. The Victorians weren't really saluting Alfred's triumphs, they were saluting their own.
as the 20th century opened, Alfred's transformation from historical figure to effigy of the imagination was complete. The poet G.K. Chesterton explained, King Alfred is not a legend in the sense that King Arthur may be a legend, in the sense that he may possibly be a lie. But he is a legend in this broader and more human sense that the legends are the most important things about him. In 1911, Chesterton published the last great epic English poem, The Ballad of the White Horse, and Alfred was its hero. It was Alfred who had supposedly cut the ancient white horse into the chalk at Huffington, even though it actually predated him by more than a thousand years. In the poem, the horse becomes a symbol of England itself. Alfred is captured, the horse is left unkempt. But in victory, he becomes its caretaker, clearing it of weeds. This custodial spirit, the poem cautions, would always be needed to defend Britain in times of danger. Thirty years later, when Britain's skies were dark with enemy planes and the horse itself was hidden to disorientate German pilots above, an extract of the poem was printed in the Times. I tell you naught for your comfort, yea, naught for your desire, save that the sky grows darker yet and the sea rises higher. Night shall be thrice night over you and heaven an iron cope. Do you have joy without a cause? Yea, faith without a hope? In the Times article of 1941, not only was the poem quoted, but Alfred was directly invoked by the newspaper. It carries a report of a great meeting between ministers of the United Kingdom and a string of countries that have been invaded by the Nazis. The Times says the spirit of the gathering was that of Alfred in Athelney. And the speech delivered by Mr Churchill, so far from betraying apprehension or awe of the vast forces of tyranny now trampling over Europe, referred to the German Führer only in terms of burning scorn. Churchill would have loved the comparison to Alfred. He was brought up in the great heyday of the Victorian Alfred cult and would have thought of him as the greatest Englishman of all time. Just as we always invoke Churchill, they always invoked Alfred. And here they are again. Britain is alone, encircled by its enemies and fighting a war that seems impossible to win. So the great Anglo-Saxon warrior is summoned up to inspire not only his own countrymen, but all free people in their hour of need. That was Alfred's high point. After the war, in more uncertain times, such a self-confident king no longer appealed. Unlike the more complex and more equivocal Arthur. ...and hear us now, confirming this our sacred vow. We swear... Since the days of the Grail, Arthur had been associated with mysticism. As Britain experienced a wave of counterculture at the end of the 20th century, he was reinvented once more. Dark Age Arthur became New Age Arthur. Heart to heart and hand in hand. Marco spirit and hear us now. Confirming this our most sacred vow. So, how do I address you? Any way you like, as long as it's not too early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, though, my name is actually Arthur Ruther Pendragon. I'm generally known as King Arthur, and I'm a senior druid from Stonehenge and here in Glastonbury. So is Arthur all right? Oh, Arthur's absolutely fine. But you've got to, you've got to remember there's three Arthurs. There's three Arthurian ages. There's a, there's a pre-Roman archetypal Welsh. There's a post-Roman Dark Age British and there's a post-Thatcher, and I'm the post-Thatcher. <laughs> right, are you literally an embodiment of Arthur? 
I believe I, I believe I am the same spirit dwells within, but I'm not out to convince anyone that I'm a reincarnation of King Arthur. I'm just out to say, were King Arthur here now, this is what he'd be doing, and it obviously is because it's what I do. Anything specific at the moment? Um, any, any issues that? Yes, yeah, specific at the moment. Arthur's particularly yeah. worried about. Yeah, what well, what we are doing is um, we're marching with the people and the trade unions, and we're marching um, against this government because we are uh, against their austerity measures that are designed to claw back money from those who can least afford it to prop up those who least need it. He always fights for the underdog, and he always fights for what is fair, right, and fair, or as I call it. Truth, honour, and justice. It <laughs> makes you sound like Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I got the cloak. <laughs> <laughs> there seems little doubt that Arthur will go on and on. He's spawned video games, TV series, and films. And today you can even experience him through the medium of online gambling. The fictional king that Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote about nearly a thousand years ago is now a money-spinning global brand. Factual Alfred will always be more prosaic. But he is one of the leading poster boys on Michael Gove's great British history curriculum. And he continues to speak from beyond the grave. Oh, wow! 800 years after canny monks at Glastonbury dug up their royal treasure trove, historical societies and TV documentaries are still playing the same game. Imagine the possibility as we stand here is that, you know, the, the, the life and the legend of Alfred the Great comes down to this. The actual pelvis of King Alfred. Possibly. Or possibly not. The point is, our need to connect with these ancient heroes is still strong. They continue to help us define ourselves. And this process of historical makeover will undoubtedly continue. We will be long gone, but new Arthurs and Alfreds will emerge. As our cycles of need for historical escapism or realism continue, Arthur is still seen everywhere, whereas Alfred is back in the library. But in the past, both of our Dark Age superheroes have been used to comfort, inspire, or negotiate change in Britain, and may well be again. Because, looking forwards, my guess is we'll keep looking backwards. The olden days always have a future. I'm now looking forward to more looking back next time, when I'll be discovering how modern Britain is a product of the Victorian obsession with the Middle Ages. Clear?